Chapter 7 Melody Off Key The blast of the phone woke me. The pad was dark as hell. I flung my left hand out for the runt. She wasn't there. I fumbled the receiver to my ear. I said, Hello, this is Mary's brother. He said, I want to speak to Mary. Put her on, yeah? I said, She just went out. She's taking a walk. He hung up. I cradled the phone on the bedside table. I switched the table lamp on. I checked Mickey. It was 7.30 p.m. I wondered if I had blown the runt. I got up and checked the closet. Her clothes were still there. I went to the dresser. I checked the 40 slats. Two were missing. There was a note beside the scratch. It read, Daddy, I took a deuce for the street. I'm going to hunt my ass off. Please try to be a little sweet to your little bitch dog, huh? I thought, I'm stumbling upon some pimp answers. It looks like the tougher a stud is, the more a whore goes for him. I'll sure be glad when those four days pass and I go with top to the sweet cut in. I gotta watch that the runt don't get hip on banging stuff. Gee, I'm starved. I gotta eat before I bang some girl. I went to the phone. The broad who should have been a wrestler picked up. I said, Anybody down there to get me bacon and eggs? She said, Wait a second. I'll let you talk to Silas, the elevator man. The old Maggie and Jigs fan said, Yeah, big timer, what is it? I said, Silas, can I get Baker's over light with toast? He said, Yeah, there's a greasy spoon right across the street. I'm going now. I hung up and went to the closet. I got the spy piece. I went to the window. I saw the old chink hobble across the street toward the Busy Bee Cafe. I made a sweep up and down the street to spot the runt. I didn't see her. I zeroed the spy into the greasy joint. The runt was draining a cup of coffee at the counter. She came out. Her eyes flashed whitely up at our window. She walked down the street, twisting her rear end at the passing cars. I saw her round black ass hook a white trick in a black hog. He skidded to the curb she got in. I wondered if it was the same joker that called. I ducked into the shower. I was toweling off when I heard a rap on the door. I saronged the towel. On the way to the door, I scooped the can of gangster off the dresser and stuck it behind the mirror. I heard Silas outside the door whistling when the Satans go marching in. I opened the door. He had a tray in his hands. I took it. A paper napkin fluttered to the floor. He stooped for it. I looked into the big brown eyes of a pretty yellow broad coming out of the door across the hall. The scar-faced stud who tooted at the roost had walked out in front of her. He had a saxophone case under his arm. She rolled her lustrous eyes at me. They rocketed to that lump on the sarong. A sly hot smile made a flat statement. Please try it for size. I skull noted her. Silas finally tore his eyes from her rear end floating down the hall. He had squeezed the paper napkin into a damp ball. He said, That's a buck. I put the tray on the dresser. I took three slats to the door and gave them to him. I said, Silas, that's quite a package with Mr. Hyde. Give me a rundown, huh? He said, yeah, she stacked tough enough to make a preacher lay his Bible down. The horn blower ain't had her but a couple of years. She done rammed her cat sent up his nose and got him hooked. She was a whore until he squared her up. He's got it bad. He don't allow her out of his sight. Any club he plays, she has to be right there stuck in his ass. If I was 30 years younger, I'd steal her. Thanks, big timer, for the deuce. Anytime you want something, call old Silas. Sit the tray outside your door when you finish. I sat on the side of the bed and wolfed down the bacon and eggs. I felt better. I wanted to feel wonderful. I put together everything for bang time. 
I held the end of a necktie in my teeth. I coiled it and tightened it around my arm. On first stab, I hit a perfect bullseye. I did Top's jack-off bit. I threw up. I just made it to the john. The kick was greater than the one at Top's. I thought, what if my black face like magic turned white? Shit. I can go out that hotel front door and sneak through the barbed wire stockade. I'd be like a wolf turned loose on a flock of sheep. That white world wouldn't tumble that I'm a nigger. I can pay them all back in spades. The dummy, the white bull, the bastard judge that crucified me on my first rap. Once I escape this black hell, I'll find a way all right. Well, nigga, you're pretty, but a bleach cream will never be invented that will make you white. So pimp your ass off and be somebody with what you got. Could be worse. You could be an ugly nigga. I dressed and powdered my face. That sure was one pretty son of a bitch in that mirror. I saw a roach scouting the tray's rim. I shoved the tray out into the hall. I thought, I gotta start stalking that fine bitch across the hall. Maybe I'll decoy the run to get past that scar-faced watchdog. I guess I'll take a walk. Maybe I can cop my second whore. I feel hard and lucky as a horseshoe. I put the can of reefer and the other sizzle into a paper bag. I locked the door and went down the hall toward the elevator. On the way, I stopped at the porter's broom closet. It was unlocked. I tiptoed and shoved the bag of sizzle behind some junk on a shelf. The cocaine had me froggy. I saw the floor indicator stop at floor number two. I took the stairway to the lobby. I dropped the key on the desk and glided to the street. The cocaine had fitted wings on my feet. I felt cool, breathless, and magnificent. It was a balmy 80 degrees. I was glad I'd left the Benny. I walked toward a rainbow bouquet of neon, maybe 10 blocks away. My senses screamed on the razor edge of cocaine. It was like walking through a battlefield. The streaking headlights of the car arcing the night were giant tracer bullets. The rattling, crashing streetcars were army tanks. The frightened, hopeless black faces of the passengers peered through the grimy windows. They were battle-shocked soldiers doomed forever to the front trenches. I passed beneath an L-train bridge. A terrified, glowing face loomed toward me in the tunnel's gloom. It was an elderly white man trapped behind enemy lines. A train furled by overhead. It bombed and strafed the street. The shrapnel fell in gritty clouds. I was too nervous for the combat zone. I whistled a general in a yellow staff car to halt. He whisked me to that oasis of neon. It turned out he was a mercenary. He shafted me a slat and a quarter for the evacuation. I got out and mothed towards a haggling flash. The funhouse. It was a bar. I opened the door and stepped inside. It almost busted the gaskets in my bowels. A phosphorescent green skeleton popped up out of the floor in front of me. It screeched a hollow howl and then dived back into the floor through a trap door. I just stood there shaking. I couldn't figure why those crazy jokers at the bar were yucking like pickaninnies. To stay with the program, I mastered a kingfish grin. I went to the bar and sat between Amos and Andy. I saw a tall stud with a Frankenstein mask on behind the log. He darted his hand in a sneaky way under the log. There was a whooshing noise like a tire going flat. My stool descended beneath me. I looked up at Amos. My nose was an inch from the log. Amos was grinning down at me. Amos said, You sure enough ain't been here before, is you slim? You from the Bigfoot country? Andy said, Well, till he catches wind, he gonna buy us a pitch of suds. We gonna learn, old homeboy, about this big city rigmarole. Everybody at the crowded log yucked in a deep southern accent. Frankenstein pushed his mercy button. I felt the stool stretching up. With the cocaine kangarooing me, 
and this booby-trapped nest of low-life suckers I stumbled into. I had more than a frantic yearning for maybe 420 at the Haven. He walked down the log to me. He said, It's all in fun. Welcome to the fun house. What'll it be? I ignored him. I got off the stool. I looked down at it. Its metal legs were tubular and anchored to the floor. It had to be a compressed air gizmo. I stepped back and looked at the two ex-cotton pickers. I twitched my nose. I looked down and around them. Then the length of the log. I fingered the button on that slingshot in my rays. I said, Kingfish, holy mackerel, boys. You smell that? I was wonder if in some poor, stupid niggas, funky-ass, nappy-headed southern mammy ain't those shit out another square-ass ugly bastard turd. Amos and Nandy dropped their jibs like plantation idiots. They shot an anguished look at the white joker behind the log. I walked out the door. They didn't dig my humor. Maybe it was too in. I slammed into a perfumed linebacker. In reflex, I threw my arms around her soft shoulders. She had the flawless face of Olivia de Havilland. She was bigger and prettier. I felt the fabric of her tailored black suit petal stroke across my fingertips. She was the finest broad I'd seen since my last movie. I wondered if she was a whore. I decided to hit on her. I said, I'm sorry. Ain't in a bitch. Baby, the first time we meet, it had to be in a collision like two square. Sugar, were you going into this tramp joint? Believe me, there's no action inside for a package like you. I just stopped in to make a call. My name is Blood. What's yours? Her big curvy legs were wide tracked. I saw the fabulous shadow of her rear end on the sidewalk. Through the filmy orange blouse, I saw a pink mole on her milk-white midriff. She brushed back a wayward lock of silky black hair from one of the big, electric blue eyes. Her even chompers gleamed like rare china. Her crimson tongue doodled across the cupid bowed lips. She was doing a bit that would have shook up a eunuch. She said, Blood, how quaint. Your idiom is fascinating. My name is Melody. I don't drink in bars. Occasionally, I go to a supper club. I am not looking for action. As a matter of fact, my car is disabled. I was going inside to call for help when our heavenly bodies collided. Is it possible that you're not oblivious to the esoteric aspects of car repair? Mine is there, at the curb. My eyes followed her manicured finger to the sparkling new Lincoln sedan. Everything about her hollered class and affluence. I thought, this beautiful white bitch has class. She sounds like an egghead. With wheels like that, she's probably got a bundle in the darner. Maybe she's got some rich suck in her web. I'll nut roll on her. I'll stay out of the pimp roll until I case her. I'll go sweet William on her. Maybe I can string her out and get all that scratch she's got, then make a whore out of her. With her rear end, this bitch is sitting on a mint. I said, Darling, I'm not a mechanic. I did learn a little about cars from a buddy in a prep school I just finished. You get in. I'll raise the hood and have a look. She got in. I raised the hood. I spotted the trouble right away. A battery cable had jarred loose. I put it back on. I looked around the hood and signaled for the starter try. She did and smiled happily when the engine throbbed to life. She waved to me. I stuck my head through the open window. She said, Are you driving? If not, I should love to take you wherever you want to go. I said, Honey, I'm not driving and it's a long, sad story. You don't want to hear my troubles. If you drop me off at some nice bar, I'll promise not to bore you with it. I got in. She pulled out into traffic. We cruised along. For two minutes, we were silent. 
I was busy trying to think of the opener for that long, sad story. I had read a cell house full of books. I knew I could rise to a smooth pitch. That old philosopher convict had told me I should forget the pimp game and be a con man. I said, Melody, doesn't fate puppeteer humans in a weird way? There I was, coming out of that joint. I had just called the garage a hundred miles away. The engine of my car burnt up on my way here from St. Louis a week ago. I was depressed, lonely, and hopeless in a big, friendless city. The mechanic had just dropped the bad news. The charge to get the car is a hundred and fifty dollars. I have fifty. I was blind with worry when I came out that door. My elderly mother has to have a pancreas operation. I came here to work for a contractor in the suburbs. I'm a talented carpenter. I need my car to get to work. I'm committed to start work the first of next week. Mama's going to die as sure as the sun rises in the east unless I get that money for her operation. The strange, wonderful thing is, darling, with all these problems, I feel so good. See those garbage cans glittering between the tenements? To me, they are giant jewels. I want to climb up on those rooftops and cry out to the stars. I have met, I have found the beautiful melody. Surely I'm the luckiest black man alive. Convince me you're real. Don't evaporate like a beautiful mirage. I'd die if you did. Out of the side scope in my eye, I saw those awesome thighs quivering. She almost crashed the Lincoln into the rear end of the gray Studebaker ahead of us. She cut in sharply and grated the Lincoln's wheels against the curb. She shut the motor off and turned toward me. Her eyes were blue bonfires of passion. The pulse on the satin throat was maniac -y. She slid close to me. She zippered her scarlet mouth to mine. That confection tongue flooded my mouth with sugar. Her nails dug into my thighs. She gazed at me. She said, Blood, you sweet black poetic panther. Does that prove I'm real? No, I know I don't want to evaporate ever. Please let's don't go to a bar. You can't solve your problems with alcohol. My parents are out of the city until tomorrow noon. Settle for coffee and conversation in my place. Will you, Blood? Perhaps we can find solutions to your problems there. Besides, I'm expecting Mother to call me at home later this evening. I said, Angel of mercy, I'm putting myself in your tender hands. She lived a long way from the black concentration camp. She drove for almost an hour. I can smell the pungent odors of early April plant life. This white world was like leaving hell and riding through heaven. The neat rows of plush houses shone in the moonlight. The streets were quiet, as maybe the cathedral in Reims. I thought, ain't it a bitch? 98% of the black people back there in hell will be born and die and never know the joys of this earthly heaven. There ain't but two passports the white folks honor, a white skin or a bale of scratch. I sure got to pimp good and cop my scratch passport. Well, at least I get a Cinderella crack at heaven. This is good. It's hip for me to what I'm missing. We turned into her driveway. I saw the soft glow of a table lamp behind blue drapes in the front room. She parked the Lincoln in a pink stucco garage that matched the house. The garage was connected to the house. We went through the back door. We passed through the kitchen. Even in the dimness it sparkled. We moved like burglars through the half-darkened house. We walked on deep pile carpet up a driveway. We got to the top. She stopped. She whispered, Blood, I was born in this house. Everybody in the block knows me. If some friend passed and knew someone was at home, we might get an unwelcomed visitor. We'll go to my bedroom in the rear. 
I followed to her bedroom. She flipped on a tiny blue light over a mirrored dressing table. The bedroom was done in pale blue and off-white. The queen-sized bed had a blue satin canopy over it. I sat down on a white silk chaise next to the dressing table. She switched on an ivory radio. Debussy's Claire de Lune sweet noted gently through the room. She kicked off her tiny black calfskin shoes. She was even more beautiful here than she had been in the street. She stroked my earlobes with her fingertips. She said, Mommy's pretty black panther don't run away now. I'm going downstairs and make coffee. She went down the stairs. I thought, I'm going to crack her for scratch. She should be good for a C-note at least. A C-note ain't bad to break the ice with. If she springs for it, I'll tie her to that bed and put my pepper specialty on her. It's certain to flip a young broad like her who's lived in heaven all her life. Besides, I ain't never slopped around in a bed with a canopy, especially one in heaven. I heard the faint bounce of her tiny feet on the stairway. She came into the bedroom with a silver service. We were going to have coffee in style. She set the gleaming tray on the dressing tabletop. She said, Blood, pour us a cup. I'm going to get out of these clothes. Then we can chat. I poured two and left them black. I sipped mine. She stepped into a walk-in closet. She stepped out a moment later. All she had on were black panties and the red top of a transparent shorty nightgown. Her small but sculptured bosom straight jutted against the red gauze. She sat on the foot of the bed facing me and crossed her legs. I handed her the cup of black. She said, So, you're going to stay in town for a while? I said, Baby, if I get strong enough encouragement, I'll stay all my life. Baby, it's a pity I had to meet you when I'm in bad shape. I want to be good company, but that car problem and mama won't let my mind stay on a pleasant track. Her ringer snapped. Eureka! She got off the bed and went to the dresser across the room. She opened the top drawer and took out a bank book. She came back and sat on the bed. She tapped the red nail of her left index finger against her white teeth. She studied the book's figures. I saw a frown hedgerow her brow. She got up and went to the dresser and threw the book into the open drawer and banged it shut. I thought, this broad has overdrawn. She's going to try the check con on me. She stooped and opened the bottom drawer. She brought out a foot-long, foot-tall metal pig. She walked to the dressing table and put the porker on the table beside me. She said, Blood, this is the best I can do to help you now. I don't get my allowance for a week. I have less than $100 in my account. Cheer up. There must be at least $100 in quarters and halves in this bank. Believe me, I can vividly imagine what it's like to be colored and faced with your problems. Let's say it's a loan. I hefted the porker for a moment to check its gross weight. It was heavy, all right. It felt a C-note heavy. I reached out and took her hand. I guided her to my side on the chaise. I put my arm around her. I kissed her and sucked that sugary tongue like a suicidal diabetic. I leaned back from her. I looked into the heart of the blue fire. I said... Baby, it's a wonderful secret that you've discovered. Not many people know that it's better to give than to receive. Maybe it sounds crazy, but I wish you weren't so beautiful and generous, so perfect. I don't see how you can miss capturing my foolish heart. You're a cinch to make me yours forever. Baby, I'm just a poor black country boy. Please don't hurt my heart. She sure had an appetite for the Jeff Con. The blue fire softened. Her eyes were misty and serious. She held my head between her dove soft palms. She said, Blood, baby, I'm white. 
but I have been more unhappy than any black person all my life. My parents have never understood me. When my whole being cried out for love and understanding, they gave me shiny things to stop my tears. Non-whites are like dirt to them. They are narrow and cold. If they found out you had been here, they would disown me before they drop dead. There is a sweet warmth that you have. I know that you can make me happy. I am so desperate for love and understanding. Please give it to me. I said, baby, you can dump all your money on the black horse to win. I'm going to win them all for you, beautiful. She said, blood, you're a black panther. I'm a white lamb. I know nothing can stop that black panther from taking the lamb, soul and body. The lamb will bide her time to take the panther. The lamb needs and wants it that way. Now listen carefully and please catch the clue of my tragedy so nothing will shock you in my bed. Blood, perhaps you are aware of the structural flaws built into the columns of the world's most famous building. It's the Parthenon. The flaw is called intasis. This contrived flaw is necessary so that the fickle human eye only sees perfection. I am a lot like those columns. I am not old, but I am beautiful. My tragedy is that unlike the intasis that gives perfection to the columns, my intasis must be concealed to protect my perfection. Can you understand? I thought, what the hell? So this broad's got a prematurely great cat? Maybe it's a little off center. If it's odd, it will be a novelty kick for me. She's so beautiful, the tricks won't notice a tiny irregularity after I've turned her out. I said, Baby Melody, you haven't opened the door to a square. As fine as you are, I wish you had two heads. Now get on your bed on your back. I'm going to make love to you Black Panther style. You got some long towels? She went to the hall linen closet. She gave me four long slender ones. She slipped off the red top and panties. She lay on her back in the bed. I saw her flaw. Was this her intasis? I saw no crotch hair. She looked completely bald downstairs. I tied both her legs to the posts at the foot of the bed. I tied her left arm to a post at the head. The phone jangled on a nightstand at her side. She picked up the receiver with her free right hand. She said, Hi, Mother. I'm fine. Are you and Dad still having fun? Mother, I miss you both so terribly. Are you coming home tomorrow as planned? Oh, good. I'll be at the airport on time. I've gone to bed. I've gotten out that anthology of Africa. I'm going to have a wild time researching the Watusi warrior. Good night, Mother. Oh, tell Dad to bring me some of that heavenly Miami beach wear. I'll be a sensation here on the beach this summer. I had taken my clothes off when she hung up. I lashed her free arm to the fourth bedpost. I looked down at her. Her eyes were pleading. She said, Remember, blood darling, you are not an unsophisticated bumpkin. You are not prone to shock states. I know you are going to find my intasis as sweet and desirable as the rest of me. I wondered why she still worried about her intasis. She knew I saw she was hairless downstairs. I put my knee on the bed. I stroked her belly. I felt cloth. I took a close look. A custom flesh-colored jock belt bandied her crotch. I ripped the elastic top down over her round hips. I jumped back. My rear end bounced on the floor. I struggled to my feet. I shouted, You stinking sissy son of a bitch! His real intercis had popped up pink and stiff 
It was a foot long and as thick as the head of a cobra. He was crying like I had put a lighted match to his intercess. He sobbed. You promised to understand. Please, blood, keep your promise. You don't know what you're missing. It's delicious, you fool. I said, look, man, I made my promises to a broad, not a stud. I'm a pimp, not a faggot. I'm getting the hell out of here. I'm charging you the porker for my time and your bullshit. He lay there blubbering. I speed dressed. I took the porker off the table and stuck it under my arm. I walked toward the stairway. I looked back. His beautiful face was ugly in anger and hate. He screamed, You dirty nigger, liar, thief! Untie me, you coon bastard! Oh, how I wish I had your black ass tied here on your belly! I said, Man, as slick as you are, you'll untie yourself before long. Yeah, that intercess could murder me, all right. I walked down the stairway. I went through the house to the back door. I walked down the driveway to the street. I walked for an hour before I got out of the residential sprawl. I was lucky to hail a yellow cab as soon as I got to a busy intersection. When it got me to the haven, the meter read 1430. I gave the cabbie a fin and a saw a buck. I looked up at my window. The runt was at it. It was 2 a.m. It had been like a nightmare Halloween all the way. All trick and no treat. I was icy sober. Then it struck me riding up on the elevator. That white faggot could cross me. What if he couldn't free himself by the time his folks got home? He was a cinch to cover himself. He'd say a nigger burglar or a hold-up man had robbed him and trussed him up. I was a two-time loser. Five to ten would stick to me like flypaper. Even if he untied himself right away, he might be mad enough to frame me. I remembered the Delansky pepper cross. I was sweating salt balls when I retrieved my stash in the broom closet. I went to my watch pocket with the cocaine. I knocked on 420. The runt opened the door. She was grinning. She said, Hello, Daddy Angel. Your dog bitch bumped her black ass off tonight. Got a piggy bank, huh? I said, So what do you want, bitch? A medal for doing your whore duty? I didn't answer the question. I looked down to see if she'd sprouted an intercess. She was buck naked. I stepped inside and bolted the door. There were 70 slats on the dresser. I turned and lowered my face. She kissed me. I put the pork on the base of the kiss statue. I gave her the can of grass. She sat on the bed. She shook some grass out of the can onto a newspaper in her lap. She started rolling a joint. I took my clothes off. I went into the bathroom to shower and scrub the sissy taste out of my jib. The piercing heavy odor of the gangster wafted to me. Over the roar of the shower, I shouted, Girl, there's a gap under the slammer. Chink it up with a rag or something. Torch a couple of sticks of incense. I came out of the bathroom and got into the bed beside her. She handed me a joint. I lit it and sucked it into a roach. I squeezed tobacco from the tip of a cigarette. I stuck the butt of gangster into the empty tip. I twisted the end and lit it. It was good reefer. I could feel my skull going to a dreamy float. I got one brilliant thought after another. The trouble was, each one I tried to hold on long enough so I can put a saddle on it, stampeded. It was maybe like the painful irritation a drunk wrangler suffers trying to corral a herd of greased mustangs. Gangster was sure whores high. That reefer confusion was no good for a pimp skull. That beautiful sissy had buried a hot seed in my guts. The wild flower blossom. I dreamily drifted into the runt. I rolled sleepily out of the warm, churning tunnel. I wouldn't need a yellow tonight. 